overrated thing in entrepreneurship is the idea. You need to have an idea, but ideas are almost a dime a dozen. This process is much more important than the idea. But this process is less important than your ability to have a strong founding team. And, and, and um, I don't know if you saw the article I wrote in TechCrunch. It's called Culture Eats Strategy for Breakfast. You, you've seen it? And this area is, is incredibly important. And people say, well, why didn't you write the book about that? Because that was really hard to write. <laughs> <laughs> this one I could write, and I actually did my thesis on part of this here at MIT. Um, there's a guy named Noam Wasserman who wrote a book on this called Founder's Dilemma. And that's the definitive book out there now. Uh, Matt Marks at MIT teaches, he, he, he's, he works with uh, Noam. He teaches a class here called Founder's Dilemma. How you create your team is incredibly important. And then what kind of culture do you have in that team is incredibly important. And it's funny, I wrote that article. Because the first one I wrote, TechCrunch, was called uh, Our Dangerous Obsession with the MVP. It's got like a million plus hits. And people say, oh, how are you ever going to keep that up? I said, I'm not, I'm not intending to. I just, I'm just going to say what I think. And then I wrote that next one. People said, no, you can't put that one out there. No one will, no one will read it. That one has had more hits than our dangerous obsession with the MVP. Um, and I've gotten crazy feedback on it. Uh, basically, um, this may be boring you all, but he's hit the nerve here, is that in a startup, it's not that things, you, can, you can't prevent things from going wrong. They will go wrong. And I'm not talking about one thing. I'm not talking about the technology doesn't work. I'm not talking about the process you screwed up in some way, sure. I'm not talking about your competitor. I'm not talking about everything will go wrong. <laughs> you know, it just that's just the way it is. And so the question is, in a startup, what do you do when things go wrong? Now, if you're a fragile system, you, you will break. If you're a robust system, you will withstand those for a certain time, like, like a wall with the, with the waves hitting it. That's not sufficient. To have a great company, you have to have what's called an anti-fragile system. That means when you get hit by things, you don't withstand them. It actually makes you stronger. It's like a Darwinian selection process. And the, and the, and the billion dollar question is, how do you build anti-fragile organizations? And that's what I kind of talk about in this, in this article. Yes? I'm sorry. That was only a very quick answer to your question. Read No Wasserman, take Matt Marx's class. Are you a student here now? Yes. Take Matt Marx's class. Yes. Um, um, thanks for the good lecture. And yeah. as you're talking about the importance of the team, uh, how important do you think is to choose the right CEO? And uh, basically, uh, how um, do you think that engineers often overestimate their ability to, to be a good CEO or CTO? And is that should, should they also aim to hire a, a business person um, that, that could not necessarily have the engineering skills? Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So, so the question, the question is, do, do engineers make good CEOs? And the answer to that is yes. Okay. And, and they also make bad CEOs. <laughs> so, and this question is, as well, is leadership, you know, is the CEO. That's not true. I mean, leadership is a capability of an organization. So if, if you're, are you an engineer? Then, then whether you're the CEO or not, you need to get other people around you who have complementary skills. Because leadership is, is not a single person. It's a capability that the organization has. And within, that, and within leadership, you should have at least four things. You should have someone who has a vision that this is possible, kind of the Martin Luther King. I have a dream that this is possible. Nicholas Negroponte, that there's a convergence that can, that's going to happen in the future. That by, its, that by itself is, 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 is necessary but not sufficient. You then have to have someone who says sense-making capability. Where are we today? What is going on? And those could be the same person, but they're often not the same person. And then if you have that, it's like, OK, here's the future state. Here's the as is state. And here's the things that are happening. And by the way, you also need to deal with this carbon-based life form called humans. I mean, this is the hardest part. Like, technology is easy at MIT. This is not what hurts MIT companies. 
what hurts MIT companies is dealing with humans in the, in the human factor, right? <laughs> um, and, and, and you all are young, but remember that. What, what, what makes or breaks company is not the technology, it's the humans. Um, and if you just remember that, if you remember nothing else. Uh, and so you need someone who can deal with the human relations to get things done. Even if they don't understand the future state and the current state, you need someone. And that's like Lyndon Johnson. Like Lyndon Johnson, you remember Lyndon Johnson, you don't remember him. He was the president of the United States. And, and Kennedy was like, we're gonna go to the moon. But he didn't quite know how to twist the arms of the, of the senators and everybody else to get it done. That was Lyndon Johnson who came in afterwards and he could get them to do whatever they wanted. You know, because he knew all their dirty secrets, he knew what they feared most in the world, he, not, he could control and sell people to get them to do something. Then you need someone who knows how to just GSD, which is get stuff done, to go from this current state to a future state that no one's ever been to before. Square peg, round hole, no problem, let's go. Give me 15 minutes, we'll get this done. And so there's this GSD element to it, there's this human relations element, there's this sense making, and there's this vision. And that does not exist in one person. It just does not exist. And so it's interesting, in my companies, the, the, the first one, I tried to do a lot of that stuff and I, and I failed. The second company, there were two of us at the beginning and we did very well, because he actually could do what, where it was going. He did the set, I could do the relationship and then the GSD. And then the next, the, the third company, it was a different mix. And there were more people involved. By the way, the company evolved over time. So, the, the success of companies depends on, on having a heterogeneous team. If you, have a, if you have four engineers, your odds of success are lower than if you have a heterogeneous team. Um, and so I would recommend that you, it, it doesn't mean you have to be a course 15 person. We've seen a lot of companies where there's course 15 people actually quite technical work with somebody else, but you should have a heterogeneous team. But who's the CEO? Uh, that could be anybody. It, it, that will kind of sort itself out. Yes? Just, just to support your comment, uh, I'm from uh, Stone, and I just organized a, a mixer with uh, Professor Ananta from Core 6 yep. to make Stone Fellows with the, uh, Stone Fellows and MBAs with the engineers to try to buy complementary skills. It's going to be the 17th of November, so you all guys are all welcome to come. By the way, the other thing today is everyone says the old, the old rationale, the old conventional wisdom was you need a hacker and a hustler. You need a technical person and you need a business person. Someone will go out and do the, you know, close the deal and do all that stuff. And you need someone who actually makes the product. It's interesting today that when you see the rise of New York and you see the rise of London and you see the rise of San Francisco, you realize that the technical person, the technical person, you're gonna not like to hear this, but the technical person is less important because technology is becoming more commoditized. You still need to have it. The business person is still important, but there's been the rise of this third person. And this third person is a user experience person who, who is called a hipster. So you need a hacker, hustler, and a hipster. <laughs> and, and this person, and when you think about it, that becomes incredibly important. That becomes incredibly important. And that's one of the things we're working on. MIT does not have a strong design school. It doesn't have a strong as a science center. But that's one of the things why we're trying to work with RISD, we're trying to deal with that. Because in today's world, you've got to understand user experience, you've got to understand design. Yes? Uh, hi, Bill. Um, so for all of the entrepreneurs here, you talked about kind of designing um, entrepreneurship. What would be your recommendation for us as we're graduating here from MIT? Would it be to you know, work for a startup, kind of learn. Would it be to just leave and try to start our own startup, or you know, does it depend? So what year are you? Uh, I'm a first year at uh, MIT Sloan. Okay. So the first thing is, you should all try to start it. The best time to try to start it is while you're here. It'll never be easier. While you're here, you should try it. Don't worry about the idea. If you can go and you know, take a class or work on something and fail, that is so much better than doing it when you're out on your own. As my wife will tell you, I did, I did my first startup at, kind of after I left Sloan, and it's so much harder Like when you, you're in the real world. Like here, you can fail time and time again, and it's much better. So I would say do it while you're here. Now when you leave here, there's a lot of questions, there's a lot of questions within that, but um, 
if you're ready, you're ready. You know, I went to work for a bigger, I worked for IBM for 11 years. Um, if you can get a good job at some place, you, you can do that. But try to keep your hand in it. You're not going to learn about this stuff by reading a book. You're not going to learn about it by taking the edX class. You have to do it. It's not a spectator sport. And is it easy to do it as a career? Like if you're an entrepreneur, oh, it's a career. Absolutely. You can't do anything else. Like you can't well, what do you mean? You can't do anything else. Yeah, you can't work <laughs> a full-time job and say, oh, I work uh, full-time at IBM, but I'm a part-time entrepreneur, but full-time. Like, I'm an entrepreneur. Well, it, it's, it's absolutely You know, this is this is one of you here. There's all these questions. I'm, 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 not, I'm not crying. <laughs> <laughs> They're hitting on important points. This is the problem. People don't take entrepreneurship as a profession. It is, it is a great profession. You know, my, I have friends, you know, one of them, Steve, works, worked at IBM. And I left. And I and it was like, crazy. Why are you leaving IBM? You, you have to understand, that my parents cried when they got a job at IBM. They were like, you have a job for life. We thought you were such a bum, and here you do. You <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and now you're giving it up. You know, to go do this. What do you? What's wrong with you? But Steve stayed at IBM. Steve was kind of, I wouldn't say miserable, but he was not very secure. I, I, you can drop me anywhere. You can drop me in Auckland, New Zealand. I'm fine. I'll create my own job. Steve was dependent on Mother IBM for his job. Another friend of mine, a friend. He he did everything right. He grew up in Quincy, worked hard, got promoted all the time. And he's now at a pretty high level. He's like 60 years old. Um, and he's in high in his, his organization. Really done very well. He's scared shitless. The organization he's part of is the US Postal Service. <laughs> he, he doesn't control his own destiny. If you're an entrepreneur, this is a, uh, you become an anti-fragile system. Bring it on. We got chaos, bring it on. We'll create a job. <laughs> so I, I think absolutely it's a profession. I think it's the profession where you can control your own destiny and you can impact the world as much as anybody else. Yes? Um, talk about your class of teaching here. What classes do you recommend students to take if you're trying to get this? So, so um, it, is, it depends on what type of, what stage you're at. So we, we now categorize people as ready to go entrepreneurs. Like, if you know what you want to do and you know, she's come back here to MIT and she's at, you know, in the MBA program. She has an idea, she wants to pursue this, that's a ready to go entrepreneur. Then you would go into a class like 15390 where we just blow you through that. If you're a, a junior here and you go, I don't know whether I want to be an entrepreneur, you know, you would take something like a start IAP class or you would take um, Founder's Journey and then you would kind of wade your way into it. And then if you said, all right, this is good, then you would work your way into something like 15390 or iTeams or something like that. But once you get into that, then there's whole levels here beyond that. Then you'd say, that's what I mean, then you'd say, I like energy, I like healthcare, I like software. Um, the other thing I would recommend it, 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 it doesn't, is there are hackathons. So if you're interested, go to a hack, hacking medicine at MIT thing. And the objective is not to build a company, if the objective is to kind of experience it and then try to meet one or two. If you meet one other person at a hackathon, so I used to work at our center, kid went back to MIT named Elliot Cohen. He met one person at a hackathon named AJ. He now has a company called PillPack. That company is absolutely on fire. It's going to be, a, a, one year ago, they, they had nothing. They had no, now they're going to be selling pills and packages, they have a pharmacy, to all 50 states in the United States. Their market capitalization is approaching $100 million. Because he met one person that he could work with. This goes to the power of getting the right team. It's about getting a team, you know, being ready for yourself. But experiment all this stuff. Are you an undergraduate? Master's student. Master's student. In what, in what area? Course two. Course two. By the way, mechanical engineering is, is, is very strong in entrepreneurship. You learn very practical skills. Bill, we'll take one last question. Okay. I feel bad. If anybody else has questions, I'll stick around. I'll try to answer quickly. Um, I was just wondering. Uh, I was just wondering. Uh, we're talking about going out to a market or a customer. Uh, what about 
in the case of the two-sided market, how do you balance um, your resources and energy on the two customers, and how yeah. do you make sure? So a two-sided market is, let's think of eBay. You know, you have buyers and sellers. You're bringing two together. You have Google. You use it, but then the advertisers pay for it. So, so what you do is you have to understand both sides of the market. But you immediately have to figure out who is the user. Because if the user doesn't use it, there's no value created. So you say, well, go to the money. So if it's Google, you say, oh, then go to the advertisers. But the advertisers aren't going to pay for it unless you use Google. So even though you don't pay for it, you're not the economic buyer, you use it, then you go that way. If it's a two-sided market like eBay, you have to say, where's the harder one to get to first, and then focus on that one. So we have Kim Gordon and Chamabee start a company, and then they're, they're like iTunes for art. Well, is it harder to get buyers of that art, or is it harder to get the, the supply? And for them, it was harder to get the supply. So they went out and lined up the supply, and then, and then went after the second one. But ultimately, you have to do the analysis on both. Can I just do it real quickly? Who else had questions? Fire away, real quick. Accelerator. Accelerator. Yeah, what do you Read the article in TechCrunch. Acceleration trumps incubation. Yes? I was curious, that, um, there's a lot of classes at MIT and can't go in here as well. What percent do you think are like engineering, considering user needs, versus like some of the classes where you kind of develop a solution, look, and then look for a problem, like yeah. making a hammer and looking for nails? Yeah, at MIT, it used to be very high you know, technology push and not enough market pull. That's our job is to start doing more of the market pull. But do try technology push, and then when you come back and take the market pull, you'll, you'll feel much better about it. Another question, yes? Do you think making a whole lot of money is the key motivation that people want to do startup? Absolutely not. What, not. what do you think is the like, main reason right now? If, 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 if your motivation is to make money, this this does not work. It made no sense for me to leave IBM and do what I did. And my wife will tell you. It, it didn't make any sense at all. And it, 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 but it, it kind of, I want to control my own destiny. I want to, I want to change the world. And, and that's what it is. Do you think Steve Jobs had any idea how much money he was making? No. It has to be something that you just really want to do and you're passionate about. Money is not the reason to become an entrepreneur. If you want money, I hate to say it, go to Wall Street. But my goal is that none of you would ever go to Wall Street. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the key difference, like people at MIT and at other like um, high-level business schools. Like yes. the difference. We don't have a business school. We have a school of management. Yeah. <laughs> it's a subtle but important one. But you're right. I mean, that's thank you for that point. It's not about the money. Yes. Um, so I know you have the GS FA program. The okay. Global Founder Skills Accelerator. That's a summer accelerator, and that's the capstone. Yes? And other than that, um, like after we graduate, what are the ways to involve in entrepreneurship? Uh, there's, yeah. the, there's the MIT Enterprise Forum, but the problem is, is that we, we have to. We only have so much resource here. You know, that we don't have so much physical space. We only have so much resource. We have to focus on you as the students, and that's why I say do it while you're here. Do while you're here. Once you leave here, it's much harder to do that. But the MIT Enterprise Forum is it. Somebody else have it? Yes. At what point are you comfortable? Should you feel comfortable to get started? Uh, that's a very personal question. <laughs> you'll, you'll kind of know. Do you have a good team? Do you have an idea? I would tell you run through the 24 steps, and then you'll feel comfortable or not comfortable. But at some point, you got to you got to jump. This is the last one. Last one. 140 yeah. characters, please. <laughs> uh, actually, I had the sensation that in the marketing of today, it's very important uh, to be success successful at low cost. So for low cost, uh, I mean that it's not important anymore the simple product that you are uh, producing, but to how much people you are producing. Uh, meaning that uh, I don't care anymore to sell that product to one person, but I care to sell uh, thousands of that product uh, to much person as I can. Do you agree with this view? No. Cost is not why people buy products. I mean, I should say that. Some people buy based on cost, but if you look at the biggest market capitalizations in the world, like Apple and Google, they're not buying based on low cost. They're buying based on user experience. They're buying based on value, not low cost. But um, actually, they're reducing the price. They're realizing that they have uh, 
the market requires that this product should be available for more people, not only but, for right. few. So, and, there, and there is, there are people who buy on price, but that becomes a commodity. So, so Android, so we have three dimensions. You can buy on cost, low cost, you can buy on product excellence, or you can buy on customer intimacy, right? Which one do you want to buy on? It depends who you are. But as a business, an innovation-driven business, you don't want to sell based on low cost. If, if, if I have tons of money, you know, then maybe I want to sell on low cost. But if I'm an innovation-driven entrepreneur out of MIT, I don't want to be the low cost, unless I'm from the logistics supply chain group here. Um, then I, then that, that's my competitive advantage. I would, I would indicate sell based on value. And, my, and, and, and Apple's coming down, but they are not anywhere near low price. Yeah, exactly. But so do you agree that there's the capacity, a big capacity of an entrepreneur is to make a product a commodity? No. The objective of an pro entrepreneur is to, is to avoid a product becoming a commodity. I, I would say it was the opposite. I don't mean to be a jerk, I just am a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> but this is MIT after all. We can disagree, right? I, I would disagree with that. That's why when you go to those steps, number step is do you have a core that differentiates you from other people so that my product is not a commodity? Because if my product is a commodity, I will live by low price and I will die by low price. And that is not where I want to be. I want to be, my product has some uniqueness that nobody else can do. With that, please join me in thanking Leo for some of the We actually have a small gift for you, Bill. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me here. And please, don't go to Wall Street. You are not the members of society, okay? <laughs>
because that was really hard to write. <laughs> <laughs> this one I could write, and I actually did my thesis on part of this here at MIT. We build anti-fragile organizations. And that's what I kind of talk about in this, in this article. Yes? But, I'm sorry. That was only a very quick answer to your question. Read No Blossom and take Matt Marks's class. Are you a student here now? Yes. Take Matt Marks's class. Yes. Um, um, thanks for the good lecture. And as you're talking about the importance of the team, uh, how important do you think is to choose the right CEO and uh, basically uh, how uh, do you think that engineers often overestimate their ability to, to be a good CEO or CTO and instead 